Uh, good evening. Um, I welcome you all to this webinar. In particular, I welcome Dr. Prachi Mishra of the International Monetary Fund to the Mishra Center for Financial Markets and Economy at IIM Ahmedabad. Uh, let me start with a brief background to the center. The center facilitates research by IMA faculty and doctoral students working in finance, economics, business strategy, and related areas. Uh, the center hosts some interesting databases uh, developed by IMA faculty including the Business Inflation Expectation Survey, an Art Price Index, and the Agricultural Land Price Index. These data have been used frequently by researchers and industry, and also by policymakers, including the Monetary Policy Committee of the RBI and the Ministry of Finance. The Mishra Center regularly organizes seminars, workshops, and conferences. We have held con uh, conferences on insolvency and bankruptcy in India, a conference on fintech innovations, regulation, in and inclusion, and uh, this year uh, in December, we'll be co-hosting the India Responsible Capital Conference jointly with the Center for ESG Research. Um, with this brief introduction to the center, I would like now uh, invite uh, Professor Naman Desai to introduce our esteemed speaker for the seminar today. Over to you, Naman. So good evening to everyone. And um, I will extend a very warm welcome on behalf of all of us to Dr. Prachi Mishra. Um, the speaker has a record which is enough to last this entire talk, so I'm going to be brief in my introduction. Uh, Dr. Prachi Mishra has a PhD in economics from Columbia University and a master's from the Delhi School of Economics, where she won the gold medal in her cohort. Uh, she has worked in several senior uh, positions with prestigious organizations like Goldman Sachs, uh, RBI, the Ministry of Finance, and the UK government. And currently, she is serving as the chief of the systemic issues division in the research department at the International Monetary Fund. So uh, I'll welcome uh, Dr. Mishra once again and uh, hand over the reins of this webinar to her. Thank you so much, Naman, and thank you, Sanket, uh, for the invitation. It's great to see you. For those of you who don't know, I think Sanket and I were in grad school together at Columbia, so it's really um, it's it's really a pleasure. And thank you for the generous introduction. I'm really honored. And you know, I've been to IMA, you know, several times in person. So it's a little bit of a, um, you know, a, it's not as satisfying to be on a, a Zoom webinar, but hopefully there'll be a next time where, where, where I can come in person again. Um, so, so so let me, you know, I, 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 how much time do I have, uh, Naman? About um, an hour, and then we'll oh. open it up for Q&A. Mm -hmm. I see. So one hour of presentation followed by Q&A. Is that correct? Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. And, um, and if it is okay with you, uh, if there is some interesting question, is it okay if I pose it during the presentation while you're talking? Yes, please. I think, please, I'm happy to take any questions during the presentation. That's even better because, you know, uh, that will make it more, a bit more interactive rather than, you know, my giving a, um, a you know, boring spiel on the paper. So, um, yeah, I think it's totally up to you, but I think I'm happy to take any questions in between. Um it's, so this is uh, joint work with Katrina Bergent and uh, Raghu Rajan. Um, let me start by uh, giving some context. Um, so how do monetary conditions in, you know, set in core countries, say the US or the Euro area, how, do, how does it spill over to the rest of the world? And this has really been a topic of my research, um, both on the policy side as well as on the research side for several years. Um, and, you know, that said, growing literature has examined this question. Um, much of this literature, however, has focused on cross-border lending and capital flows more generally. So in this paper, what we do is we explore another facet of uh, spillovers from um, monetary policy in core countries and its effects on um, cross-border mergers and acquisitions, which I will call m um, through the presentation. Um, so let's pause and think about it a little bit. So think about the United States and think about, um, you know, a situation when uh, U.S. financial conditions are loose. Uh, so for these periods, we know that, you know, it's, 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 it's pretty well known that corporate leverage in countries outside the United States actually goes up. And why do we really care? Because um, it's been established in the literature and it's well known that le leverage is a significant predictor of crises in the future. Um, you can ask the question, why are we looking at mergers and acquisitions? And let me give you a couple of reasons here. Um, the first reason is that mergers and acquisitions create leverage as the acquirers who are trying to acquire um, you know, a firm in another country borrow money to acquire a target. 
Um, now you might say that you know this is the case for you know what's so different about M and A's because this is the case for most investment. Um, but what is specific about mergers and acquisition is that the literature shows that there's often no value added. Um, whereas if you look at other investments, for example, FDI, a country can actually experience productivity gains through new investment. Mergers and acquisitions merely tend to shift capital around and do not necessarily create um, a new investment and increase productivity. So from a policy perspective, there is a risk that um, you know, they create large such mergers and acquisitions actually create large um, uh, levels of leverage during loose monetary policy without any obvious benefits. Uh, so this is you know, a brief motivation for why um, we look at um, M&As. Um, let me um, just before going into the weeds of the presentation, let me just um, give you the key takeaways uh, if you want to have um, you know, the bottom line. I think there are three key takeaways. First is that we do find that financial conditions in the core countries, again, core, think about core as the US or the Euro area, they have significant spillover effects on cross-border um, mergers and acquisitions. So uh, if you look at the magnitudes about, you know, um, 100 basis point on average, 100 basis point easing um, or, you know, let's say a, a easing of the U.S. financial conditions is associated with a 10 percent higher volume of cross-border mergers and acquisitions, which is fairly significant. I think the second um, uh, key takeaway is actually the main focus of the paper, which is that, you know, the spillovers are actually stronger for countries with a higher stock of liabilities denominated in foreign currency or in US dollars. And uh, let me um, elaborate a little bit on the magnitudes. So basically, if you're an acquirer economy, which is in the 10th percentile of net foreign exchange liabilities, say Colombia or Japan, 100 basis point easing of the FCI is associated with roughly about a 1% um, you know, increase in deals um, compared, and if you compare that to a country in the 90th percentile, say the Netherlands or UK, it's almost 11 times as large. And um, let me, you know, I want to make sure that, you know, I'm describing the mechanism in simple words and people actually get it. So if, so if, say, if you have loser US monetary policy, what happens to the exchange rate? The, the, the US dollar actually depreciates. In other words, I think the local currency, if you're in India or Brazil, that appreciates. If you're an acquirer, if you're a firm who's an acquirer, you actually get a big net, net worth uh, boost because, you know, and you get a bigger net worth boost when you have more FX liabilities because the value of those um, uh, liabilities declines in domestic currency when, say, the Indian rupee or the Brazilian real appreciates. And that actually increases um, your ability to acquire. And we find that, you know, the magnitude is even bigger when we consider US dollar liabilities. You can ask the question, you know, why do we care ultimately? And here, I think the th third key takeaway is important because um, what we find is that um, a tightening of US financial conditions is associated with higher excess returns for the acquirer around the months of the acquisitions. So in other words, acquisitions that happen around tighter financial conditions actually create more value while those that coincide with loser financial conditions are associated with weaker performance, at least um, you know, as suggested by stock market reactions. And um, what we find is that indeed, a, you know, a number of acquisitions that reduce the value of the acquirer at the time of the announcement take place at a time of loosening global financial conditions. And actually the mean excess returns for the acquirers at such times are in fact negative. So let me maybe Naman pause here a little bit and see if there are any questions before I go into the weeds of the presentation. No, no questions so far. No. Yeah. Maybe everything is crystal clear. Um, so this is um, uh, the outline of uh, the rest I of the am, presentation. We have one. Sorry, we have someone from I am uh, Calcutta. If it is the same Manju Jaiswal who I know, <laughs> and she's asking, have you examined the mode of payment? Um. So this. Paper is not about, um, you know, the mode of payment, you know, how you're making the payment. I don't even know if there is data, but this is about, the, you know, it's, it's, it's more about, um, uh, you know, what currency your liability is and how does, how do um, global financial conditions spill over to a country like India when, when corporates have borrowed a lot in foreign currency. 
So I think um, we don't have, you know, the mechanism we have in mind is not does not depend on the mode of payment. And, you know, unfortunately for this project, we don't have data on the mode of payment and how acquirers, but I can see where the question is coming from. I think uh, we don't know how acquirers, whether they are paying through a bank, whether they are paying through, I, I don't know, other forms of uh, payment. So this is the roadmap um, of the rest of the presentation. Uh, let me talk uh, very briefly um, on the literature and how we contribute. So sorry uh, to interject, the... sorry. Uh, so Manju has come back saying data is available as stock is a mo as a mode is going down in cross-border M&As. Right, right. Sorry, can you describe again? Um, Manju, do you want to come over and we can yeah, get Manju in the thing? She, she can ask the question. Could you please get Manju into the panelists? Oh, you can unmute, yeah. Okay, now you yeah, can do yeah, it. Uh, yes, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. No, I was just uh, 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 coming from the background that uh, since leverage uh, was talked about and uh, mode of payment stock versus uh, cash does play a role uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, cross-border MNAs in particular, where uh, Historically, data shows that stock as a mode is going down, and uh, uh, perhaps leverage may have a role uh, to play there because, uh, um, as it was being uh, mentioned, that uh, easing of FCI uh, tends to show more leverage across. So that's where I was coming from. Yeah, thank you. I think it's a good point, um, uh, but I think it's, a, you know, I think the mechanism we have in mind, and probably when I go through the presentation, I think it might be clearer, is independent of how, you know, actually how you pay. I think the mechanism is, you know, if U.S. financial conditions or global financial conditions is uh, the U.S. dollar depreciate, if you're a local currency, you know, if you're, uh, if you're Brazil or India, uh, your rupee or real um, appreciates and you get a net worth boost. I think the mechanism is independent of um, the mode of how you're how you're making the you know is it through cash or is it through uh, stocks uh, is 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 I think independent. But if you know if there is data, I'll show you what disaggregated level of this data kind of have. validates the result that you mentioned that uh, uh, in tighter conditions vis-a-vis -vis is easier conditions how the creation of value result if you have got that. Yeah, because uh, oh. uh, in easier conditions, uh, leverage easily available, uh, but then the incentive to create value through m &A may be relatively lower as compared to when the conditions are tighter. So interesting. that's where I was coming from. Thank you. Interesting, interesting, interesting. So it's basically support, it's supportive evidence for the mechanism. Thank you. Thank you very much, Manju. Um, so let we me- We have one on. more question from Vasu on the same issue. Yeah. Vasu, please go ahead. He's one of our own faculty. Uh, so, hi, Prachi. So, uh, so one question on the mechanism that you were talking about. See, uh, in the last few, uh, the episodic events of easing of uh, this financial, uh, that is, uh, by monetary policy easing has been followed by a flight to safety also, right? Like, uh, does it necessarily indicate that uh, US dollar will uh, depreciate? Because uh, what, what we have seen in the 2008 crisis, or let's say, at least in the last 20 years, uh, the, the loosening monetary policy has been associated with uh, some sort of a flight to safety towards US dollar, right? So I'm not sure whether that intervenes in the how much it is strong, but that is also a counter way to think about it, is what I'm uh, wondering. Yeah, I think it is a good, it's, it's a good point. Um, I think our analysis is a little bit independent of whether the, uh, you know, uh, what happens uh, in terms of uh, what actually happened. I'll, I'll show you results which are consistent with the mechanism 
uh, I put forward, but I think mm-hmm. it's basically symmetric when you are when you have um, you know if if if, if the US dollar um, uh, say say appreciated because of the mechanism you are mentioning that is you know there could be flight to safety and US dollar appreciate then if you're a if your country like um, uh, you know Chile or uh, Brazil or India then you know uh, you actually if you hold a lot of FX dollar liabilities um, and and if your local currency depreciates. Uh, vis-a-vis, vis-a-vis these uh, FX liabilities, then you actually, your net, net worth goes down because if you have, um, so in effect, I think um, uh, this could hold, um, uh, you know, symmetrically for uh, the dollar appreciating or um, uh, depreciating. Uh, but I'll, you know, of course, um, we'll see what the results are. And then, you know, I think we can, we, we can think through. Thank you so much. Um, so, um, uh, you know, so our paper contributes to a growing literature on estimating spillovers. Um, as I said, I think on the question of how uh, do monetary co- conditions in the core reserve countries spill over to the rest of the world, um, you know, uh, much of this literature is focus- focused on cross-border lending and on capital flows. Um, uh, more generally, in this paper, we are exploring another facet, um, which is the effect on mergers and acquisitions. Um, uh, let me check the time. I think probably in the interest of time, I will not go into the details um, of the literature, but I'll just say that um, you know, in comparison uh, with with the uh, uh, with the existing papers, our contribution is twofold. Um, one is uh, we focus on the effect of a common source of spillovers. So there's a literature which has looked at you know country specific determinants of spell- spillovers, and the papers by um, Weishback, Irel Liao, and uh, Weishback. You know, more recently a survey paper as well. Um, where, um, you know, they focus on time invariant um, uh, characteristics like, um, you know, geographical location, uh, etc., which, which can matter, common language, physical uh, proximity, which can matter for uh, MNAs. We are looking on a common sp- source of spillovers, which is, you know, policy settings in the core country. And um, uh, we do find that, uh, you know, uh, core country condition uh, are a tend to you know and and a, and a consequent say uh, appreciation in both target and acquirer country uh, uh, acquire and target countries tends to enhance M and A activity and especially in the presence of higher uh, uh, higher uh, foreign exchange borrowing in the in either country. I think the second uh, I think the uh, the, the second con- key contribution is um, you know there are papers which establish the role of domestic financial conditions. In driving MAs, particularly in the 1990s, there was a wave of mergers and acquisitions in 1990s. Our papers pointing to the importance of global financial conditions, and um, I, and to the best of our knowledge, we also the first to compare the ex post performance of um, MAs uh, during loser and tight, tighter global financial conditions. Um, so let me try with this slide um, to again um, uh, go through the mechanism which I already described. So our first step is to assess whether U.S. financial conditions or U.S. monetary policy can affect cross-border m and But we also want to address how. And um, it's not, not just if U.S. financial conditions can affect cross-border m and And here again, to provide um, you know, intuition for the hypothesis, uh, we go back to a theory paper by Diamond, Hu, and Rajan, which was published in 2020. And they argue that, um, you know, for, for example, just for example, if there is if, if there are easier global financial conditions or easier financial conditions in the US, they can be associated with a stronger um, local exchange rate uh, outside the United States. And an and, and, and appreciation in the domestic exchange rate, again, if you are um, Brazil or India, will actually um, reduce the relative value of corporate borrowing in foreign currencies and increase the value of corporate equity for those firms which have high borrowing in USD or in foreign currency. And um, in this setting, I think there can be, this can have an effect on both um, um, uh, the acquirer and the target. And let me say that, you know, our um, hypothesis on the acquirer is clear. So when an acquirer experiences an increase in equity uh, through lose, lose global financial conditions, this should increase its ability to make cross-border acquisitions. Um, our um, hypothesis on, um, uh, on, 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 on on targets is less um, is, is is less is, is less clear. Let me say that you know um, uh, uh, if, uh, because for the target you can think about that you know um, uh, 
as for the acquirer, the equity of the target increases in times of loose financial conditions and target might be a more attractive purchase. But I think for the target, um, uh, domestic exchange rate appreciation may also make it more expensive in foreign currency to purchase the target. So what we do is, um, you know, we will test this channel empirically and um, uh, how is test how easy your financial conditions can affect MNAs through the net worth channel. Let me again pause a bit um, and see if there are any questions. I think I screwed up a little bit on the slide, but I think it's fine. Um, uh, let me, let me, let, you know, if uh, if there are any questions, maybe. On no, I think we can keep going. There are two more general questions which we can get okay. to at the end of the. So let me talk a little bit about the data. Um, so the data, I think, you know, this audience must be knowing that this is really the Bible of m &A data. This is uh, from the Security Data Corporation. Uh, this is the merger and corporate transactions database. Um, the sample we use for analysis is 2000 to 2017. Why do we use sort of a dated sample? Of course, two reasons. I think the paper has been going on for a while. And also, we didn't want to get into the effects of COVID, et cetera, in this, in, in this paper. Um, we have uh, roughly about a half a million deals. Uh, about 40% or so are cross-border. Uh, the interesting thing is that I think I don't, we don't mention it here, but I think it's um, a, one third. So, so it's 43% in, in numbers, but it's about 30% in values, 33% in values. So, you know, a lot of cross-border deals actually are small um, and um, uh, in our data, you know, have very small values. That's, that's why in values actually, um, it's, 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 it's that smaller. Um, so we have uh, and one, you know, one problem um, with, uh, uh, let me, let me, let me also say that, um, uh, uh, so about, I think, uh, um, uh, about one, 180 countries, and um, I'll show you some, some details about a third of the total value is about cross-border. Um, we deal, we worry a lot about missing deal values. So this, I think, has been an issue in the literature on trade, also in the literature on capital flows. Uh, there are lots of missing values. So about um, uh, so how do we deal with missing values? And this is a big econometric uh, issue. So what we do is, so what are these missing values? So these missing values are likely to be associated with you know, smaller private firms. And basically at the, at the level of the raw data, we assume them to be equal to zero. And then what we do is we collapse the raw data at an acquirer, target and year levels, acquire a country, target country and a year level. And um, it, just think about it that we can have two, two observations per uh, country pair. So it's so acquire A to target B uh, and, and uh, you know, acquire B to target A. So for the baseline, and again, I might be going into two details, too many details, especially from a perspective of webinar is that, um, you know, we drop the country pair time observations where all deals have missing values. So we cannot tell whether it's actually missing or it's actually zero. Um, however, if it's missing between the first and last years, so there are non-zero values for a country pair between first and the last year, but it's missing in between, then we assume it to be zero because you know at some point, just think that you know, if Brazilian firms have no um, reported acquisition of US firms in selected years, then uh, uh, the aggregate value of acquisition from Brazil with targets in the US are likely zero in those years. So you have reported values, non-missing values in the beginning and the end, but they are missing in between. We fill them equal to zero. And again, you know, we do a lot of robustness checks with these, you know, how do you deal with uh, missing one, values? One like, related question to this yeah. discussion, uh, Switcher Chadda is asking, are the acquirers uh, considered only from the USA or uh, is no, this ESO is a, access? No, this is a, yeah, there are about 180 countries in the data set. They can oh. be acquired, they can be target, and I'll show you some, uh, you know, how actually uh, advanced, uh, I'll, I'll show you some, you know, it, 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 it will be, uh, so we have more than. Uh, and, and the first. second question was from Manju again, is like, um, what is the impact of the dollar depreciating, appreciating compared to a currency? You know, what if the acquirer firm is from a core country like the US with the dollar right. depreciating right. versus target from the non-core? Um, right. Are there any impacts on those right. issues? Yeah. So we we explored a little bit the heterogeneity in you know in some of our findings. That is, if you know if 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 acquirer versus target 
uh, is, is advanced versus emerging, emerging versus emerging. In the results, we don't find much difference, but I'll show you some stylized facts on what these look like. Um, so other key data, I think this is, um, you know, our financial conditions index. We use the US for most of our study is from uh, the IMF, the Global Financial Stability Report. Uh, this is a database that the IMF uh, maintains. So this is basically a composite index. It's an average of a number of indicators with time varying weights. And these include, for example, interest rates, um, equity and house prices, um, exchange rates, and um, a higher value of the financial conditions index indicates more tighter financial conditions. The other key uh, component of the data set is the data on FX liabilities. Again, um, we use a couple of measures. I think a baseline is a measure from the IMF, which is based on a country's international investment position. It's um, a stock measure, and it includes a country's overall liabilities. Um, and then for robustness, we use a measure from the BIS and from the SDC itself. So, so, so the BIS measures basically is a little bit narrower. It includes liabilities of a country only to creditor banks. So in a sense, you know, if the creditor is only a bank rather than uh, the IMF measure, um, but they are you know, pretty highly correlated. I think the correlation is 0 0.9 and the results are very similar. The SDC measure is a bit different. It's more a flow and it's the total value of FX and US dollar bond issuances and new syndicated loan originations by non-financial corporates. So basically for each, we start with the micro data here and for each country and year, we aggregate the micro data at a country year level. And then, you know, for robustness, we also uh, accumulate the flows over the last three reported periods to get more like a stock, you know, to get a proxy for a stock measure. So this is, I think, um, just some stylized, begin with some stylized facts on the data. In this figure, you can see um, uh, we, are, we are plotting domestic mergers and acquisitions if you're acquiring in your own country. Um, international mergers and acquisitions, um, if you're acquiring outside, this is cross-border. And the green dash line is FDI because this is often compared, you know, m are often compared to FDIs. Um, so basically, you know, you had, you since the beginning of our data set, um, or early 2000s, there was increase in both domestic and international m &As, but then it remained fairly subdued before rising again uh, more recently. Um, if, you look, if, you, if you look at the numbers, I think if you look at um, you know, total value of cross-border, it's, um, it's about 33, as I said, it's about one third of if you combine domestic and cross-border both. So it's about cross-border M&As are about one third of total M&As. The other important fact is that, you know, uh, how does it, how do, this question we always get, you know, how do you compare the cross-border M&As with, um, um, uh, 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 with, with FDI? And uh, I think just for information, what is the difference between FDI and a merger and acquisition? So FDI, if you think about foreign direct investment, it has two components. One is greenfield investment, basically new assets in a foreign country, or it could be acquisition of pre-existing assets. And a cross-border M&A basically falls into acquisition of pre-existing assets, where domestic firm acquires a firm in a foreign country. Um, if you look at the magnitudes, I think M&As actually represent quite a significant share of overall FDI, again, about 36%. So um, M&As are big and have increased a lot over time. This, I think, uh, a little bit to um, Manju's question, that is, you know, how, how does it compare, you know, have stylized facts on, uh, uh, you know, M&As when you break up the data a little bit. Uh, so figure on the left shows by country grouping. And as you can see, see the big elephant in the room is, if, of course, advanced economy uh, acquirers acquiring um, advanced economy targets. This is, this, this, this is the blue line. Um, both emerging, for example, is, is the orange line. You cannot see it very well on this scale, but this has also risen over time. Um, on the right, we show the type of the acquirer and target, whether they are public, they are private. Um, a big part of this data set is they record private, um, you know, private M&As as well. Um, so most of the acquisitions, as you can see, are when um, a target and the acquirer both are uh, publicly listed. Um, so let's, uh, you know, let's get to our um, basic question. Do M&As actually correlate with 
global or US financial conditions. And to answer this, we do uh, you know, more uh, a very simple exercise. So this is basically we collapse our microdata at, um, on individual MNAs into the acquirer country, alpha, um, a target country, tau, and a year level T. And um, we, we basically regress it on acquirer and target fixed effects, and you have a residual. And we plot the predicted residual against um, US financial conditions. And this chart just shows that you know, there is always there, there is a negative correlation, which, you know, for example, if US financial conditions are loosening, you have more MAs, or um, uh, you know, when, when US financial conditions are tightening, you have um, uh, lower MAs. So on average, um, this, uh, this is a very basic exercise which shows that um, you know, even after controlling for acquirer and target fixed effects or you know, acquirer and target countries, country specific characteristics, the value of MAs is actually negatively correlated with financial conditions uh, in the US, and that is controlling for domestic characteristics. Um, we established next. We establish this a little bit more um, rigorously. So we we estimate a regression. We have value. Uh, sorry, Vasu. Vasu has one question. I think he raised his hand. So yeah. Uh, so yeah, Prachi, what is what is interesting is that actually the the charts look somewhat like if you, the previous slide that you showed. Uh, it looks like uh, there is a shift, as in it seems like the financial condition sort of. If you shift that uh, blue chart one period, it sort of will look like the same as the so. Right. Yeah, so it it's responded, like but with a lag, a little bit of a lag, I think. Um, yeah, yeah. And, so yeah. It's very interesting, yeah. but uh, I think I want to understand: like, should this uh, be then uh, interpreted in the way that uh, you were saying that it's a negative correlation, or should it be some other way yeah, to? I, I, to make too much from this graph, Vasu, right. because I think it's still we do a lot of rigorous stuff. But right. It's like a first. I think it's like a first. Okay, that these are negatively. If you look at the correlation between the two series, it's negative. But right. again, I wouldn't read too much. We do much more rigorous uh, stuff as we go on. Sure, sure. Uh, one more question from Manju on the same issue. Yeah. yeah so Prasi, on the same uh, the graph, after uh, if you could could go back to that graph slide. After 2010, the trend is kind of reversing, right? Uh, uh, the uh, the two going in different direction vis-a-vis -vis post 2010, I see uh, uh, the direction as uh, not very uh, uh, different. Yeah. yeah. So I, I, again, I, Manchu, I won't read too much into this graph. This is the first pass, but we do, you know, econometrically, we try to distinguish if we get different findings pre and post crisis. We didn't get much. I think on heterogeneity, either by type of target, acquire a country, you know, advanced versus emerging, pre versus global, post global financial crisis, we've not um, got much differences. And I, you know, if I have time, I can talk about it, but the results are in the paper. Sure. Thank you. So, so, so then, you know, we check this correlation a little bit more formally. So we run a regression where uh, we have um, uh, the total dollar value of deals between acquirer country alpha, uh, target tau, and, uh, and, and, and time t. And on the, uh, on the right-hand side, we have uh, the U.S. financial conditions, uh, which is uh, in the U.S. As I said, this is, um, uh, this is created, this is an average of uh, 10, 10 financial variables such as corporate spreads, sovereign spreads, long-term interest rates, et cetera. Um, all these um, you know, specifications we control for um, uh, you know, target times acquire a fixed effects. And um, I'm not sure. So these fixed effects basically control for um, any time invariant, but bilateral uh, country characteristics. As I said, you know, there's huge literature trade in, in, in finance, which says that, you know, they're, they're, it's, it's physical proximity, uh, common language, which, which drives both, um, uh, you know, trade and capital flows. And that's what we are, we are trying to strip out here and see, even then, do, do global financial conditions matter in uh, driving m as around the world? And um, here are the results. I think um, the baseline results are reported in um, column one. Um, so we have 48,316 observations. Um, this is based on an unbalanced sample of 180 target and acquirer countries. And it's about, uh, it's across 18 years. Um, uh, and, and, and as you can see, the estimated coefficient on uh, US financial conditions is, is negative. 
uh, in sign and uh, statistically significant at conventional levels. And um, so basically, if you look at the magnitudes, it's, it, it's suggesting that if you have a one percentage point or 100 basis point reduction or easing in US FCI, that's a associated with approximately 10% higher value of deals. And, and the magnitude is therefore large. And then, you know, for robustness, we also, this is very commonly used again, you know, um, uh, US monetary policy shock. Uh, uh, we, we find pretty similar results instead of US FCI. Um, I think that columns three and four are interesting. Basically, uh, and this was, I think, one of the questions as well. We try to isolate the, the spillovers to the rest of the world, because I think here we exclude the US. If the US is acquiring or US is a target, we exclude the US here. And um, we get pretty, uh, you know, a, a similar finding about, you know, I think 8% of our observations um, include the US. So if you drop, drop these, I think you still get very significant effects. So this is actually isolating the spillovers to the rest of the world than US being, you know, in, in the data itself. Um, uh, so as I said, you know, I think the, um, uh, if we are talking about uh, exchange rate, I think is the mechanism we have in mind. So why not look at exchange rate uh, directly? So here we use um, uh, exchange rate, US nominal effective exchange rate. Again, um, I don't know if you, uh, so, so these effective exchange rates are weighted average of bilateral exchange rate vis-a-vis -vis partners. Um, this is, again, um, this data is from the IMF. I think um, uh, just to let people know that an increase in NER or the nominal effective exchange rate um, is actually equivalent to an appreciation of the exchange rate of appreciation. So increase in US NER is an appreciation of the US dollar and um, an increase in, say, a target um, and, or an acquirer NER is, again, an appreciation of the local local country currency like Brazil or India or Chile, uh, if they are target or an acquirer. Um, uh, so I think, if again, we focus on um, column one. It says that a stronger United States NER or um, or, um, uh, um, uh, or, 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 or is or a more appreciated US dollar is actually associated with um, uh, lower uh, lower MNAs. And what is the mechanism? If you think about it, if you look at um, uh, in say, you know, in the acquirer or the target in particular local currency exchange rate rather than here, you know, a, a proxy for global financial conditions, um, the sign is opposite, but it makes sense because here it's telling you that if you have um, a lower value of NER, um, then, you know, the correlation is positive. So you'll have a lower, MNAs, so meaning that you know um, a more appreciated local currency exchange rate uh, is associated with uh, with um, uh, a more a lower a lower um, NER or a more depreciated uh, exchange rate local currency exchange rate is associated with lower MNAs. But think about you know if your currency is more depreciated, then you know you have. Um, you have more, you know, this is consistent with our net worth channel. Basically, you have less of a net worth boost if your currency, if your local currency is more depreciated, your foreign FX liabilities, uh, you know, mean more in uh, local currency. Um, I think, um, I, I, I think the difference between column two and three is column three actually includes time fixed effects as well, um, where, where you can control for other things happening globally, such as, you know, um, if there's wave of global mergers, et cetera, you can control here. Um, column four, again, is interesting because I think it shows that um, even if you exclude, um, um, even if you include the US FCI, that still has exclusionary power even after controlling for um, country-specific uh, exchange rates. So I think, um, uh, 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 put differently, global credit conditions matter, even conditioning on country-specific valuations. So I think this table is an important table. I think basically bottom line from this is, uh, this is suggestive evidence for net worth channel. So if you're an exchange debt appreciation, um, it, it basically in, in a particular country like India, Brazil, Chile, uh, that increases the debt capacity of um, firms who have borrowed in um, uh, foreign currency and therefore increases the, um, the ability of the acquirer firms to, to acquire, acquire elsewhere. Maybe I can pause a little bit if there are any questions. No, I think they would. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, when you talk about this monetary policy shock, uh, right. 
So uh, can you tell us uh, briefly about uh, how you construct that monetary policy, Sean? Yeah, I think we have not constructed, Sanket. It's uh, from Yakalo and Navarro. This is basically, um, you, you um, they strip it out, they strip out, you know, regular, this is getting the exogenous component from movements in uh, monetary policy. I think they estimate a Taylor rule and get, get a residual, basically. Something like a Taylor rule and get, because ultimately you want a more exogenous component. As you know, the profession is really after, uh, uh, you know, uh, identification Taliban, as I would say, <laughs> identifying things correctly. So here, even with FCI, we are looking at global FCI and US FCI and looking at, you know, acquisitions in India or Brazil or Chile. It's not that endogenous. And that's what we find. But I think this is to please the, you know, the identification Taliban that even if you put something really, really exogenous, um, which is less likely in this scenario, the endogeneity concerns, because it's less likely that, you know, uh, US financial, you know, uh, the decision to acquire or uh, India's decision to acquire, um, uh, acquire uh, uh, some firm in Brazil or the US should not affect US financial conditions, even though that problem is less severe here. We just, you know, this is just to satisfy the identification. So one, one more question uh, that has come up is, uh, what relationship is observed between economic conditions and acquirer returns? Any insights? Um, yes, I think this is a good question. And this is our third takeaway. And I'll show you exactly that. You know, how do stock returns change? Because ultimately, that's what we care. So do around glues or tight global financial conditions, how do you know, how do, um, uh, you know, how do valuations change and how do, and, uh, and we'll, I'll show you some results on those. So this, I think, is, um, again, an important uh, slide. I think, um, uh, so the mechanism I, you know, I've been trying to push through is that um, it, it goes through the net worth uh, of the corporates. And if that, the NAT net worth varies with the value of, uh, you know, your liabilities in foreign currency, or in uh, a, or in um, a, in U.S. dollar in particular. So here, I think um, uh, this this equation is important because this is the key equation we estimate in the paper. And here we are seeing that look the sensitivity of um, uh, you know M and A's to U.S. financial conditions can actually vary depending on um, you know how much um, FX liabilities uh, the acquirer have and the target have. So this is, I think, uh, uh, is a key equation um, in the in the paper, and this is, you know, um, I think in the literature we refer to it as um, a Bartik Bartik kind of um, an empirical strategy, where the share is given by um, the lagged foreign currency um, uh, liabilities. Uh, this is the share, and uh, the shift is given by you know the financial conditions. Uh, globally or uh, in the US. So the idea is that, um, uh, 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 the idea basically is that these are not, um, uh, the, the share is not influenced by the shift. So this is the share, it's predetermined and it's not influenced by the shift variable. So this is a shift share Bartik kind of approach. Uh, so basically uh, the idea again being that, you know, uh, 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 US dollar liabilities or foreign currency liabilities are not um, influenced by the desire to acquire or not. So basically, um, uh, the share is not influenced by uh, the sh shift variable. Um, again, you know, this is estimated without, with and without country fixed effects. And um, basically, if you, um, uh, if you include country fixed effects, then you cannot include the base effect of FCI. If you omit country fixed effects, um, then you can actually see um, the effect of the FCI itself and the interaction. Um, we do find, I'll show you the results. We do find that, you know, uh, both um, uh, gamma and delta are, uh, are negative and significant. So basically, if US financial conditions say loosen, um, the dollar depreciates, um, if the local currency appreciates, and if you are more, um, uh, you know, if you have higher FX liabilities, then you get a, a, a bigger net worth boost and you acquire more. So, so, so a gamma negative says that in times of loser financial conditions, if you are a firm in, say, India or Brazil, which has a lot of FX liabilities, you actually get a net worth boost and you acquire more. And this is, you know, basically we'll find that both gamma and delta are negative. 
and um, uh, but the effect on you know the acquired effect is more than the target. Um, let me go into you know showing you some results. Again, I think um, the main uh, the main purpose is to get the mechanism through. But I think this is basically this table shows the results from a, a show, um, estimating the equation I showed you before. Um, uh, so column uh, so columns as I said you know columns um, one and two are um, uh, are, are basically with FX overall FX liabilities. Whereas columns three and four use the US dollar liability. Um, again, you know, columns two and four also include time fixed effects. That's why you see that the base effect of FCI is missing from column, columns two and four um, because it's absorbed by the time fixed effects. Um, so let's focus on column one and three for a minute. I think it's important because here you can see that um, uh, the baseline effect of US FCI which we saw to be statistically significant in previous slides is no longer the case. What matters is the interaction with FX liabilities. And this is what uh, you know, we are trying, uh, trying to establish. So the reds basically are showing um, uh, the negative coefficients on the interaction with both acquirer FX liabilities and target FX liabilities. And it doesn't matter whether it's overall FX or it's just the US, US dollar liabilities. And in all columns, you see these reds, the interaction effects are actually um, a negative and statistically distinguishable from zero. Um, and, um, and we also find that the magnitude of the effects are much higher for the acquirer than they are um, for the target, as you can see in column one or column, column two here. So it's more, I think, the acquirer mechanism that, that you know, if US financial conditions loosen, um, if you're an acquirer, you actually get a boost in net worth and you go and acquire. This mechanism turns out to be more, you know, uh, you know established by the empirics than, than that, at least in terms of magnitude and significance as well, because we did, uh, you know, different robustness checks than uh, the target. So again, bottom line from this table, uh, if uh, you can think about it symmetrically between loose financial conditions or stronger financial conditions, let's say stronger US financial conditions are associated with lower M&A activities in countries with higher FX liabilities. And in particular, if you're an acquirer country with higher net foreign exchange liabilities, um, you engage in greater merger, merger activity when you, US financial conditions are easier. So uh, again, easier financial conditions, lower US FCI, um, think about um, you know, an acquirer economy, um, your local currency appreciate, you get a net worth boost and you go and acquire more. And especially if this is true for an acquirer. Um, so this is the magnitude. So again, if you're in 10th percentile of FX liabilities, say you are a Colum Colombia or a Japan, and if you're in the 90th percent of FX liabilities, 90th percentile, you are UK or Netherlands. Um, so for an acquirer country in the 10th percentile, basically um, 100 basis point uh, easing of FCI is associated with very small, about you know about a 1% increase in deals. However, it's almost 11 times as much if you are a country in the 90th percentile. And if you ask me, this is you know, one of the main you know, uh, findings in the paper, that it really depends. Um, it's the interaction with FX liabilities that matter. And if you are very high FX, if you are really leveraged in FX, if you're a firm in India, which has very high FX uh, liabilities, US dollar, you know, um, uh, say, this, uh, say US financial conditions are very loose, uh, US dollar depreciates, um, your local currency appreciates. So your value of your FX liabilities in domestic currency actually goes down. So if your liability goes down, your net worth goes up and you go and acquire more. But it matters, you know, uh, so, so, so this, you know, the negative coefficient is just showing that um, and you can think about, you know, now there is tighter U.S. financial. There's all, you know, there's tighter global financial conditions. You, you know, increase in interest rates. So if you have tighter um, uh, uh, global uh, financial financial conditions, say U.S. dollar appreciates. Um, if you're a local, you know, if you're a local acquirer, um, your net worth actually goes down because your local currency depreciates. And if you borrowed a lot in FX, 
um, uh, you know, your value of liability in domestic currency goes up. And, um, and, and that's why you acquire less, I think. It's, so I hope, you know, this is one point you know, I'm trying to get through and hopefully this is gotten through. Um, we've done tons of robustness checks. The paper is up, um, you know, on, uh, is up online. Um, I, 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 I think, you know, you could be worried about a lot, lot of things. You could be worried about, um, you know, valuation effects affecting a left-hand side variable of mergers as um, you know, val you know the, the value of mergers in US dollar could also move with the financial conditions. So we, we showed you, you know, um, we included time fixed effects to control for that, but I think we also use counts and you can say count is a more cleaner measure, which is, you know, less subject to valuation effects. Um, you could say that you know, the only reason we are finding the effect uh, for U.S. financial conditions because U.S. financial conditions actually co-move with domestic financial conditions. However, you know the, the findings are robust to uh, including domestic financial conditions, and we actually find that um, uh, U.S. financial conditions to be more significant for cross-border M&As. Um, uh, you can also say that you know while U.S. financial conditions um, might not only matter for cross-border M&As, but also for domestic ones. And this, I think, I expect this question to come up. Why should it matter only for cross-border and not for domestic? However, what we find is when you look at domestic M&As, it's domestic financial conditions, which are more significant rather than the U.S. financial conditions. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip the rest of the robustness. I think there's one more robustness I think we will, um, I want to show you. This is about, you know, does it really matter whether it's the U.S. or it doesn't matter really if, if, if it's the euro area? And here, what we do is we try to do uh, include the euro area effect as well. And I just want to focus on column six here. And as you can see, um, the interaction, when you put both these interactions, what matters is, um, uh, is US FCI and its interactions with FX liabilities than euro area FCI. So it's really you know, just establishing a little bit um, more the exorbitant privilege of the US from perspective of transmission of global financial conditions. So we find that um, uh, you know, spillovers to M&A are driven by changes in US financial conditions rather than um, by financial conditions in the euro area. Um, this question I think came up. Um, so ultimately what we care about is you know, the value addition of deals that take place during lows, lower, lose or tighter global financial conditions. And what we do is um, to answer this question, we estimate um, specification for abnormal returns around the announcement of the specification, uh, announcement of the acquisition are regressed on uh, US FCI at different horizons. So how do um, excess returns vary depending on how global financial conditions change? And as you can see, um, it, it, these are the results. I think what we find clearly is that no matter how we twist the data, that it's basically you know, um, robust evidence for tightening of US financial conditions to be associated with higher excess returns around the month of, uh, of, of, of the acquisition. So there's more an event study kind of um, analysis. This is for all deals and this is only for cross-border deals. And as you can see, the estimated coefficients are positive uh, at all horizons. This is you know, different horizons, how many months. So doing, you know, tweaking the parameters of the event study here. Um, uh, and, and the results are similar, whether it's you know, uh, domestic or cross-border. So basically, you know, the findings here suggest that acquisitions that happen around tighter uh, global financial conditions actually create more value. And those that coincide with loser financial conditions actually um, uh, report relatively weaker performance. I think this is, you know, ultimately why do we care? At least from the, you know, from the stock market perspective, this is uh, what we find. Um, uh, let me, with this, I'm almost done. I think, let me conclude. I think- um, Question yeah. from Manju uh, again. Um, yeah. Uh, was the previous table suggesting that domestic deals are adding, creating value? I think both domestic and cross-border, um, I think uh, if you look at only all deals or whether you look at only cross-border, you find the same, you know, you find the same result that when you do these deals around tighter global financial conditions, they tend to add more value. Whereas if you do these around loser financial conditions, they, 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 they add less value. So ultimately, what, why proportion, what proportion was domestic in this sample? Roughly um, so all, all, uh, let me just check uh, quickly on this. How many observations do we have for all versus 
Um, just give me. Um, so we have around, you know, you, um, let me just see. I think one third, if I'm not mistaken, no? one third is cross border. So let me just check quickly. Um, Yeah, I think it's it's roughly one third. I don't have the numbers on. Never mind. No. Never mind. Touch. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So just to um, uh, conclude, I think um, what we tried to show is that financial conditions in the core have significant spillover effects on cross border mergers and acquisition. Our focus is on the interaction effects. I think um, so. We are saying that look, this finding. Uh, may not merely be a reflection of easier um, uh, financial conditions in the core being mirrored by um, policy responses in other countries. This is what you can ask. It's not really global financial conditions, but they are mirrored by policy responses in other countries. Uh, we do find that transmission is stronger in, in some countries than in others. And uh, typically countries which have higher degree of foreign exchange liabilities. And again, here suggesting um, uh, a net worth channel of spillovers. Um, so, so therefore, I think what we are seeing is an impulse given to merger and acquisition activity, which need not primarily be based on real economic conditions and investment opportunities, but on valuations and access to financing altered by impulses other way, uh, uh, you know, elsewhere. I think that's the main contribution of, um, and, and ultimately we do care because, you know, deals that happen when financial conditions in the US are tighter um, and therefore acquisitions are fewer, they add more value for the acquirers as reflected in, you know, higher acquirer excess returns around the announcement and conversely when they are. So is, there, is there any specific reason one of our attendees is asking that question? Right. Um, why do we see? Um, yeah, I think. Um, uh, so I think what we are trying to show is that you know during loose finance uh, financial conditions, I think um, you make the wrong decisions and you know you it ends up badly. At least based on stock market reactions, I think it's. Uh, and during tighter financial conditions, I think I think um, it be it would be good. This is a good question. It would be good to you know pin down a little bit more. Uh, the mechanism um, at a more you know micro level, maybe yeah, we, maybe we should talk to a few people and see what. Uh, but this is consistent with our prior. That is, you know, when there's loser financial conditions globally, I think there is probably at the micro level uh, bad decisions made in terms of um, you know uh, at, at the very micro level. I think so less discipline. At this would be my guess, but I think it'd be good to establish. I think a bit more. At a micro level, uh, uh, just just a suggestion on that. There could also be like simple uh, market premium kind of a because you during uh, let's say uh, weaker like, that is monetary conditions, the market premiums are generally higher. So your benchmark is slightly higher. So if you right. do it at that time, you will probably have a lower effect compared to tighter monetary policy, policy conditions where it might be. No, that that possibly could be a channel. I'm not sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. This is a more benign explanation, right? Relatively more benign explanation. A um, couple of more general questions, uh, which are India specific. So one question is, how does m in the United States impact FDI investments in India, particularly in the context of prevailing US financial conditions? And this is a question right. from Venkat Subramanian. Right. I think we, um, uh, so our study is on, um, on, on m &As. As I said, you know, FDI is basically, you can think about FDI as two, right? One is greenfield investment, the new assets in a foreign country. And the other is acquisition of, you know, pre-existing foreign assets. I think cross-border acquisition falls into the latter category. I think when a, a domestic firm acquires another firm in a foreign country. Um, so how, you know, how, um, yeah, I, I don't have a, you know, a specific answer to your question because we don't look at that because it's not also about FDI. Um, uh, but this is a, you know, this is a significant portion of the FDI. I don't know if this answers your question, Ashu. Venkat, would you like to unmute and ask the question yeah. yourself? Let 
think he's okay. Um, there is another question from Utkarsh uh, Singhal, who is asking about uh, how this uh, recent news of JP Morgan announcing India to be included in their bond index is going to impact uh, uh, how, how will it show value to this added leverage next year, taking into account tighter policy in India and so on. So just to give you a broader, better context, I'm going to put the question in the chat. Uh, it's, it's a slightly longer question, so you could I see. read those. I don't have an answer, actually. Mm -hmm. This is a very, you know, is, 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 is a very, um, uh, you know, how, because see, I think adding a part of the bond index is again, more about cross-border lending, capital flows, et cetera, rather than mergers and acquisition in particular, because merger acquisition is more, you know, uh, a, is, 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 is a different animal, I would say. So I would not expect per se an effect of, uh, you know, um, of you know, India being part of the JP Morgan bond index on, uh, on M&As, but I don't know. There could be some indirect channels, et cetera. But it's, that's more about, you know, capital flows, cross-border lending, rather than mergers and acquisitions, it's very more, you know, corporate kind of a decision, right? Okay. Maybe they're more, you know, they get more funds to acquire. I don't know. I think it's India is able to borrow more to acquire. And I think it's, uh, yeah, that could be one of the mechanisms, but hard to pick. I think in our analysis, it's more, I think, absorbed by some of the fixed effects. I think Venkat is now here. Venkat, you could unmute and talk and ask your question personally. Venkat, are you there? I think something's, yeah, that's okay. Yeah, there's some uh, uh, yeah. audio issue. With yeah. yeah. Only been three years since the pandemic, so we are still learning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, one question from my side, uh, Praji, if you have yeah. still time. Like, uh, one, uh, one thing is how is this MA financed might also be important, right? For example, uh, you're talking, uh, you presented a result which is very interesting that uh, those countries or firms which have excess uh, foreign exchange uh, liabilities essentially uh, seems to uh, be having the highest kind of because of the currency appreciation that could also be other thing that they because they have been previously getting the debt uh, yeah. in US dollars they might again because of the loose monetary condition they can again raise debt and that might right. not be net worth effect as much as financing possibility effect. Right. I think this is a fair enough question. I think we don't want to capture every, we cannot capture everything in the analysis, you know, how they are financed. I think this mechanism, it goes through leverage. And if they are, you know, uh, if it's financed through leverage, right. um, and if you are a higher FX liability uh, firm, then, you know, your uh, net worth goes up if US financial conditions loosen um, and you're able to acquire more. Uh, but I think if you have other sources of financing and, you know, if you, I think, okay. uh, I think this was also related to a question, I think in the beginning on, you know, whether it's stock, whether it's, um, uh, whether it's, um, you know, whether it's cash, I think, uh, so there could be a lot of other effects going on. I think it's more, um, I think uh, the goal of this paper is to more um, pin down a precise mechanism I think we have in mind. And we could actually, we don't have data actually on how it's financed. Um, I have to go back and check at SDC, which gives, it's more like, you know, this firm acquired this firm, there's a value of the acquisition um, rather than, you know, in which country, et cetera. But I don't think we have, you know, how did they finance the data? Yeah, yeah I'm I'm sorry, I got dropped off. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, get all of it, but uh, right, thank you. Right. Um, I think we'll have to, uh, uh, end of the number. Yeah. So, uh, Prachi, thank you once again for the wonderful talk. Uh, we have had some very thankful comments also in the Q&A, thanking you for all the insights. And uh, we look forward to having you on campus next time rather than uh, on video. Uh, yes, yes. I would prefer yeah. a lot, you know, coming <laughs> yes. on campus rather than doing it. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's very hard to get across, uh, you know, these, especially these... Mm -hmm. Complicated papers, very hard to get across. I think no matter how smart the audience is, like 
at uh, at RMA. I think it's it, it's but, 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 <laughs> but as research presentations go, we had a pretty big audience. They were almost at one point they were almost seventy people in attending the talks. So thank you, thank you so much, Naman, and thank you, Sanket, for inviting me. And I look forward yeah. to coming again. And thank you, Kapil, for all the organization. Thank you. And we do look forward to having you on campus. So please do let us know when you come to India. Yes, sure, absolutely. Yeah. See you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. Have a good rest of the day. Yeah. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.